mata ata titro, mata fakaromo, mata mahitahi, mata manawanui, mata awa kataya e mata kataya e tata. Uh, translation, um, by believing and trusting, by, by listening and hearing, by seeing and doing, and by having patience and perseverance, we can all succeed. <laughs> right, um, I've got an apology for lateness for Councillor Tibble. She's just got something she's got to get on with. So she, thank you, moved by Councillor Robinson, seconded by Her Worship the Mayor. As it's our first meeting, just a couple of things. I don't mind if you don't call me Chair. I don't care if you don't call me Mr. Cranston, call me Andy, anything. I know there is a formality requirement, but I'm not too phased by it. So that's your choice. If you do have something that you are um, particularly uh, concerned about and you do want to have status, you can stand, but otherwise I don't expect you to stand. So that's your choice as things go on. Sometimes you get to an important situation and you want to hold the floor so you can stand to accommodate that. Okay. So, any declarations of interest? Thanks, you. Yes, uh, um, Kotiarai Te Awa. Um, yeah, that's in the next meeting. Next meeting? Yeah. But the same thing. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I was expecting that, but yeah, wrong meeting. Nothing else? Um, another thing, and it could be because I was, um, I was away when it could have been discussed. I was just a little bit surprised to see the functions and the uh, terms of reference for both the committees being exactly the same. I think I had an expectation and it's probably just not my understanding. I might need clarity from Nadine, Michelle, or possibly Riyad about the differences between the two committees because the functions and terms of reference are identical. And uh, my, there must be one paragraph then. There's a lot of terms of reference and functions that are exactly the same. All right. The other thing that could be helpful is we have different colors. Yeah, thanks. Okay, we're going to the, uh, yeah, that's covered off. No leave of absence, no acknowledgements of tributes and public inputs and petitions. Yes, Councillor Gregory. Uh, just getting to that. Let's go and shoot that. Okay, we'll go there now. With the governance work plan, um, it possibly will come up when we are speaking about Tolaga Bay Wharf, but I was up there last weekend and having had a playground over the road from me carted off because of a little bit of rot, there's a real concern at Tolaga with the Waharoa. It's very rotten, eh? So I just hope that that's going to come up in the government's work plan for Tolaga as to is it a safety concern or, or what's happening? But the level of rot in that is very disappointing now eh? because it's such a such a neat asset and such a neat gateway to the wharf to have it breaking down like it is so soon. Um, so definitely make sure that's part of that. Yeah, uh, we've we've got well, it's on. That's the problem. It's on both. So. Do I, if something's on boat, do I wait or do I deal with it? That's that's what I'm kind of saying about both functions being the same. We'll follow up yeah. and we'll come back to you. Yeah. Sure. Anyone else? Governor's plan. Thank you, Councillor Gregory. Uh, thank you. I just um, not probably not understanding the way it's working, but there's a thing here. The Waikanae Transformation Program update is on this um, governance work plan and other things that are on the 15th of December are coming up in this meeting, but that is 
for the 15th of December, but it isn't on this agenda. Just wondering what the go with that is. Thank you. So the the two that don't have timelines allocated to them, I've got integrated catchments, which hasn't got a slot, and um, livable spaces. They haven't got a timeline indicated. Livable spaces, and so are they in February? Yeah, we'll update the work plan. All right. For Thank this you. Oh, also, Carl Kahu, Mr. Chair. Carl Kahu as well. Thank you, Councillor And My pate is around the um, Hawaii Tūranga Hawaii Tūranga update. Now, um, this is the piece of art that is around the Aupuni area, and I understand that um, it does have a timeline here to mid-February committee 2023, but I also understand that it has been um, a long time waiting, um, and I do realise there was also asbestos, so I, I would really would just like a brief kind of update that, you know, is the asbestos being dealt with? Are we progressing to a mid-February update? Is that going to go well? Kia ora. You okay with that? Yep. Yep. Thanks. Sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> So in terms of Hawaii Tūranga, uh, Council had an amount of funding that wasn't going to be adequate for the contamination, the mediation and the construction. So additional funding was sought through the Better Off funding, uh, which has come through. The consultant project managers are currently seeking cost estimates on the detailed design, um, and that is imminent so in terms of pricing, which will give us an understanding of the scale of remediation because there is contamination, but also uh, what can be achieved within that envelope. So that will be coming to the next February meeting, but that's, that's essentially the update. No one else? All right, thanks. So we'll go on to page nine, which is the allocation of the natu nat Natural Heritage Fund. Sorry. And, yep. Sorry. Um, on page eight, second, from, two from the bottom, I don't know if you identified this, I missed this. Can you the uh, vehicle fleet update, decarbonisation plan. Is there a timeline around that? I'll get that one for the next meeting. Yeah, actually, I have a question. Why is a vehicle um, fleet update? Under four waters infrastructure. <laughs> Should be in the other. So, is it going to, did you say, Ms. Fry, there will be an update at the next meeting? We'll update the governance work plan and. Right. Move a motion that we've got a teething problem which will be sorted very shortly. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Robinson. Sorry. Next meeting. Yeah. Next meeting. Yeah. Okay, if there's nothing more on the governance plan, we'll move on to page nine, allocation of the Nat Natural Heritage Fund. And we've got Melanie online, I believe, who's the author of this. She's not there yet. Got a head of it. Uh, this, this is always oversubscribed. So, um, but uh, yeah, there's been some marvelous work done with this over the years. Um, so as you can see, it is oversubscribed again. Um, a question I did have for Melanie was how the 
partial funding decisions are made because I see one's $25 less and some are half. <laughs> so just if there's a rationale how the partial funding is allocated. So I can attempt to answer that while we wait for Melanie to come up on our um, streaming. The, the whole uh, series of applicants go through the, um, the assessment criteria, which is in the appendix, and uh, the, uh, the applicants are in communication with Melanie um, to discuss the, um, the extent to which we can fund them and also whether it's going to actually advantage the project. So they make an assessment based on that criteria, but also in discussion with the landowners who have applied. So, and, and then it comes to a judgment call. And I guess the final question that you'd give to them would be if they are partially funded, can they still do it? Absolutely. So, so there's, uh, and that is part of that conversation is can, can you still proceed? Um, and is that, is that funding going to be of value to the project? All right. Councillor Ria. Tēnā um, On my um, part, I was around, I read through the Gisborne District Council Natural Heritage Fund Regional Priority and Biodiversity Merit Ranking Sheet, which is kind of like a rubric. Um, and I was just, I didn't notice that in terms of the applications, is there anything in the applications where the groups applying can state the level of engagement with their neighbours, whether their neighbours are mana whenua, whether they're farmers, whether they are... Um, uh, at any anybody is there a um, does that if they there is an area in the application for them to state that is there any waiting towards that application because I, I didn't see anything in the rubric that you can see that applicants have actually gone out of their way to create relationships with their neighbours in order to effectively accomplish this the, these biodiversity goals and objectives. Mm. So I can note that point to follow up with Melanie. But I do note that uh, one of the three of the applications are neighbours, so it goes over three contiguous properties. Yep. Councillor Parata. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, I just wanted us. Well, I, I just wanted to ask some questions about um, how this fund was again promoted. I can see that there are no. Um, approved projects further than a Noda Bay um, and just wanted to find out how how did we communicate this further than um, in our main sensor area but I also wanted to say um, that the projects that are approved look awesome it's really great to see Matawai it's really great to see Motu um, Te Karaka represented in those spaces and really um, commend council for ensuring that our whanau that way are being supported. I, I just want to find out about our communication channels and whether or not perhaps are we doing enough to ensure that everybody has a fair and equal opportunity to apply for these funds for their biodiversity. Thank you, Chair. So, so in terms of the community, the engagement and notification of this, uh, as in the report, it does talk about it being promoted through the Council's website and the Gisborne Herald, um, and also the digital e-newsletter that we have around um, our Pānui um, environment um, uh, kaupapa. So that is all very generic. So in terms of targeted engagement, um, I'm not aware that it's um, we've targeted a specific community. So, um, yeah. Or state more than a question. Um, is that perhaps what I'm saying is that maybe that's not enough. Maybe that doesn't go far enough. Maybe we're not penetrating our communities deeply enough. Maybe we don't have enough relationships across the little here to be able to give everyone a fair equal opportunity. So, um, Perhaps that's what I'm asking more is for the comms team or the supports around that to look at how might how might we get that message further. Thank you. Councillor Parata. I wonder if Melanie thought we were still on one o'clock. Possibly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Councillor Paru. 
<laughs> Pahuru Huruai. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, just in addition to that, one, as I've maybe suggest that the Rural Road Show is a great way to get mm. information out to um, those because it goes right up the coast and also out west as well. So that, that's a great um, regular face that the council has in our rural communities that, you know, loads them up with really good information like that. And, and like the one I want to um, congratulate the council on on this because you know, Ahakoiti, he Pounamu, um, it might not be everything that they've asked for, but I'm sure it must be a big help. The monitoring, though, like I guess in terms of reporting, the, the reporting, the, the monitoring and the reporting of these comes back to your team. Yes, so so we monitor and we monitor the projects, and there is a report that comes back to this committee with an update on how they um, how they went as well. Thank you, Councillor Foster. Um, yeah, I, I haven't added it up, but it's, uh, it's over 100,000 that's already been allocated, and there's 40,000 that's been um, approved from, from the ICM team by the Central Organising Group, Group Land on, on top, which I guess is part of that. And we're saying it's oversubscribed all the time, and it's such a great initiative. And how, how can we get some other funds into this? Is there any other external funding that we could include in this in the future or because it's such a great initiative and, and, and um, being over allocated um, indicates how popular it is with the community and you know we had a measly 40,000 <laughs> originally which has jumped really quickly to 100 and now we're 140 and still oversubscribed um, you know how, how can we accommodate our communities um, um, great initiatives by you know, um, utilizing this fund to its fullest so this is essentially an external fund. So this is one of many funds that these communities can apply for. So uh, our way of increasing fund would be through the LTP process and a decision of council to increase that fund. Uh, but there are other avenues uh, beyond council that, other, that the community groups can apply for additional funding. So, um, so it's not... Yeah, and saying that, I know there's other applications, but because this, you know, is, I, I think it's already quite confusing for the community when there's all these different funds that you can apply for for a similar outcome. Mm -hmm. So to group them all together would be a way better way of achieving a better goal, I would have thought. So, okay. you know, how, how can we, how can we um, encourage that kind of um, thinking? Noted, thank you. And, and Mel is on the screen now, so she may have further thoughts. Welcome, Melanie. Um, Unfortunately, we did kick in before you arrived, but if you've got any... Uh, my, my apologies, I thought the meeting started at one o'clock. Yes, yes, our fault, our bad. <laughs> Do you have anything you want to um, add on to the report or...? Um, yeah, sorry, I missed the beginning of the conversation, but um, I think uh, the report can be taken as read. Um, I tried to summarise each project um, to make it clear what the objectives were. Um, and yeah, we had a lot of interest this year. Um, really exciting to see so much um, interest in doing excellent work from the from the community. Um, and it was great to be able to support um, some more of those projects this year with a little bit of extra money uh, that we had available. All right, thank you, Councillor Robinson. I noticed a number of the projects um, include planting. Um, and cumulatively, uh, they all out to a lot more plants. Do we have any ability through council to um, access cheaper plants for people exercising uh, under this grant so that they get more bang for their buck? Is there something you're aware of, Melanie? Um, not that I'm aware of, no. At this point in time, most of the projects source their plants through the Native Garden Nursery. Um, and I'm not currently aware of any opportunities to get those plants at a discounted rate. Maybe it's something we should pursue because we're funding thousands of plants and we, we ourselves plant thousands of plants and we've got to get the buying power. The other side of that is the issue of keeping up with it for because we are into the thousands and thousands of plants quite often. It's, Availability. Councillor Ria. 
Kia ora. just in terms of a person who in her actual job buys at um, native plants, um, our suppliers are um, uh, Soraya Pohatu and her team with Rungwhakata. They are our main supplier is the um, native tree nursery out at Makaraka. Um, and they do offer a very good competitive price. And the other bonus about um, sourcing plants locally is that they are born and climatized in our weather. They are used to our soil. Um, so when we do, even if we did get a cheaper rate outside of the district, um, the percentage of the survival of that plant actually goes down because it's not grown to our climate and our soil and all of those sorts of things. Thanks for that insight sure information. Councillor Telfa. Yeah, um, I, I, looking at this, look, this is a great, um, obviously a great um, thing we're doing here, the Natural Heritage Fund, but I'm just also looking at it, and I'm looking at it, the amount of, of projects through here that are around walkways, um, and, and, and this is a real sitter to me um, to actually be part of catchment plans. And we've already had discussions around catchment plans and rivers not having and local people not understanding what's happening with their waterway. I, I think this is a, a real, almost a catalyst um, to actually bring a whole lot of these things together in individual catchment plans. And um, like I'm not here to tell people how to do anything, but I just think there's a real opportunity um, locally for local catchments to form their own groups and look at their own um, catchments and come to council with a plan um, and then council's role it's not then expecting council to do everything here but then council's role will be coming um, how are we going to help fund this and, and access so I just think there's a whole lot of things going on and really good work in different departments but I, I think there's a real opportunity here to maybe put them all in the same place um, and the actual the actual communities that live there um, almost run them. So just a comment. Thanks for that, Councillor Silva. Councillor Tupo. Good to you, Mana. The um, similarly to um, Councillor Telfer, the um, it does seem a lot of repetition of spend across a range of projects, and whether or not council has had a thought um, to invest in where those spends are um, at their most um, prone. For example, if we have local nurseries um, contributing to all these projects, do we have a mind to invest in those facilities to increase their capacity um, so that we can um, generate more return through an investment in plants rather than individual grants for purchasing plants, if that makes sense. And also I think in um, a lot of projects requiring traps, whether or not there's a, a capability of this fund to fund trap making. And um, we, we could create a, a, a capacity locally to build these traps and then those traps go out to, to projects that um, need them. And there might be some efficiency gains in terms of the, the, the quality of the material that um, we're funding and also mm -hmm. the um, amount of projects that we're able to support by building further the capacity of us to produce and, and putting our fund money, partly part of our fund money towards helping in that manner. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Okay, there's been some good discussion there and some points that the staff will take on board. The purpose of the paper though is to um, allocate this funding and you've got them all listed there in the recommendations. Uh, it would be up to someone to identify something that they weren't in agreement with. Otherwise, I'll just take them all as a lot. Moved by Councillor Telfer, seconded by Councillor Foster. Anything further? All those in favour? Right. Against, carried. Okay, moving on to page 23, the appointment of Deputy Chairperson of Operations, Environment and Communities. Um, personally, I've had a bit of a think about this and I'd like to uh, nominate uh, Councillor Ria for this position. Um, and we're probably in Heather's hands as to the voting process we do have to undertake. Yeah. Yeah. 
So I've nominated and uh, Councillor Pahuru Huruwai has seconded it. Any other nominations? All those in favour? Against? Carried. Hands up. You can vote for yourself. <laughs> All right, Land Overlay 3A and Sustainable Hill Country Project, page 26. On that voting system for deputy mayor, for, for that, it says, um, when electing a deputy mayor committee chair or deputy chair, the local authority must resolve to use one of the following two voting systems. It's got yeah, systems. Yeah. If there are more than, yeah. yeah. So, only one person nominated. no, but I'm just saying it, 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 you have the option to use the two voting systems. It's got system A there, it hasn't got system B to know what that is. Right, thank you. Yeah. So we did T26. Okay, so Kerry, is he around? So around? Kerry isn't here today, so I'll be taking questions on, um, on this report, but essentially it's an update on the Sustainable Hill Country Project, which is a, it's been a standing item um, reporting to the Operations Committee in, in previous years. Um, and it's really talking about progress towards achieving um, the works plans associated with the requirement under the TRMP. Um, but I'll take the report as read for okay. if there's any questions. Okay, thank you. It is a noted report, but I'm sure people have got some uh, a little bit of clarity or anything they want? Anyone? No? Well, if there's nothing there, noting the comedy point, moved by Her Worship the Mayor and seconded by Councillor Rhea. Nothing further. All those in favour? Against? Carried. Uh, review of winter air quality and consideration of new research 32. And it's another noting report. Kate Sykes, team leader. Who's Kate? Is Kate? Kate here? No? No, Kate? I think going to up as 12 might have thrown our staff out a bit. Well, the best uh, yeah. so fast. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Right, well, I'll take it as read. Is there any discussion points anyone wants to bring up? Except for the fact that our air quality is worse than I thought it was. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Councillor Reid. Thank you, Councillor Post. Like no comment. I mean, it's obviously that we've got, um, we're exceeding our, our limit, our new limit now that's been um, lowered. And um, looks to, looks like you know wintertime fires are our main main contributor. I just would like to know what the future holds for how we mitigate these um, elevations. Um, you know, because people aren't going to get rid of their fires. There's not many really alternatives at this stage unless we um, crank up the power consumption. So um, yeah, um, do we try and you know, hope for more windy winters or? <laughs> Yeah, how, how do we see um, that we're going to mitigate these um, sentences for the future? So through you, Chair, um, this Thank is you. something that we'll be addressing through the Tarafti Resource Management Plan Review. As you may recall, we've now designated an airshed around um, the urban part of Gisborne City. Um, so the next step is then to figure out what we do about the air quality problems. As you've noted, it's not an easy problem to solve because we do believe a lot of the issue is associated with the use of home heating. Um, we do have examples from elsewhere in the country where there have been incentives or subsidies provided to homeowners to upgrade their heating systems so they're a lot cleaner burning, um, for example, in Rotorua and, and Christchurch. But that will all be something that we you need to work through as a council. On top of that, is there any other mitigating issue, uh, issue, uh, measures like you know, planting more trees, um, having a 
I'm not aware that that will help with the issue, um, but we can look into all, you know, all the possible solutions. I think there probably is a education uh, part around this, which could be helpful. I don't know how significantly helpful it would be, but uh, Greenwood, Wetwood and Wrongwood education would probably help a bit because that's where a lot of the issues are. And I am the chair that we've had a particularly wet winter and you may find a lot of people have been burning wetter than normal wood mm. and, and that could be something, but you're right, an education program around it, but it's good to hear we'll be looking at it under the TRMP. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Thompson. Just a question, um, says on the still days, the, the pollution's a lot higher, I, I take it, because the wind's not blowing it away. Um, so places like Wellington, are, are they really putting less pollution in the air or is it just blowing away? Anything <laughs> <laughs> further? Well, they've probably got less heat. They've probably got less fires in Wellington. You'd have to imagine many of them have. Yeah, it pumps. just doesn't seem like a fair sort of fault fair test because it just depends how windy it is. Yeah, I mean, so through you, Chair, the weather and climatic conditions do affect whether the particulates disperse or not. But I really the key thing to remember is that having these particulates in the air affects quality of health. So people will die sooner and earlier if the problem is not resolved. So there's a lot of evidence to show that. So we can't rely on the wind to blow the problem away. We have to take action ourselves. Yeah. Okay, if there's no one that hasn't spoken, Councillor Foster's got his hand up again. <laughs> Councillor Foster. Yeah. Huh? Oh, you could. Oh, oh. Yeah. Oh, well, um... Adding to the air pollution, what about um, pine dust? You know, pine stuff that comes off the pine is that included in the? It is. It is air pollution. It is air pollution. Through you, chair, I would have to report back. I'm not sure the size of those pine pollen particles and whether they're picked up or not in this type of monitoring. But we can let yeah. you know. All right. Uh, another note in report moved by. Moved by Councillor Verdi, seconded by Councillor Robinson. Nothing further. All those in favour? Aye. Against? Carried. Okay. Flood mitigation proposal downstream property station to Arai River. That's infrastructure. We've done. Ben? Yep. Yeah, we don't muck around. Not like <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, through those recommendations um, and talk through to some of the challenges that we're having in this area. So happy to take um, any questions from yourselves. Yeah, thank you, David. And um, apologies, I didn't introduce you to start with. Um, David Wilson, director of Life Pines. Right. Right. Um, yeah, we've, there's a lot of us already been out to see the site over the last six months, and um, I think some of the new councillors have been out there over the last um, week or so. So it's um, it's a bit of a sad situation, really. Um, but I'm happy to open it to the floor for comment. Okay. Your worship. I have a question that caught my eye, page 12, uh, where we talk about the cut drain that was done on consented work. Is this something, Mr. Wilson, that we spotted around our region, which might uh, contribute to some of the issues we see? Because that is, when I read that paragraph and trying to, also council have reached out several times to try and get um, it fixed. Is this something you spot around the region often and um, how do we act to get this addressed because that is obviously contributing to the problem quite a bit. So through you Chair, a number of issues we have across the district are when people are undertaking works that they may think is alleviating an issue on their property but it's actually causing a big headache for us. Um, over time a lot of these schemes that were put in 
decades ago, people changed ownership. They come in, they modify things, not knowing that the adverse effect it will have. Very much it's about an education approach from our team and the way that we do this is through our inspections. So um, as you would have seen this morning in the um, finance and performance, we have annual percentages of our schemes that we had to have checked to try and find issues like this to resolve them. Uh, we try and educate, try and work with whoever's done the works, um, but then there is, of course, enforcement action if people don't undertake what they need to to reinstate. How do we find out about these uh, drains? Is it usually someone dobbing someone else in, or we are uh, note like this? Obviously, we've noticed this and it had some some effects. Is it? What's the process? Through the chair, it's a mixture. So a lot of the time, people, concerned landowners, will get in touch with us around some works that have been undertaken on a surrounding property. The other one is through our drone surveys. So we are using drones more and more to fly areas quickly to see if things have changed or not. And a number of those have been droned. We've also got our LIDAR and a whole lot of other ways of looking to. Councillor Thompson. Yeah, I, I um, noted the drain myself too. Um, yeah, I think it mentions he has asked to fix it four times and it hasn't been fixed. I'm just, in terms of a flood, does liability fall on him if, if it causes damage or what's the go there? So through your worship, sorry, the chair can't promote yet, Councillor. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Through the chair, it's one of those things where we're working through the landowner to actually understand that they're contributing to the issue. With a lot of these rain events, they're contributing to the issue. The fact that that drain has been modified the way it has is causing water to flow to where it shouldn't. However, it's still a very um, busy catchment. There's a lot in that river, but also the sheer volumes of water we're talking about for some of these events they are contributing factors. They're not the only factor as to why those are responding the way that they are with the pressure they're under. That's right, Robinson. On the cut drain uh, point, it was cut by Papatu Station in relation, that's what it says in the report, in relation to this proposal. Who, who was Papatu Station? Because I couldn't actually identify that in the report. So you worship, there are a number of land holdings here. So Papatu Station is one of the surrounding ones there. This, I don't want to go into naming who's been done it. We're in a public forum, but we are working with the person who has done it. We know them by name and we're working with them to try and get it resolved. Councillor Tolkien. Yeah, look, um, yeah, after going out and viewing the situation, I'm well aware of the, of the, um, you know, the cost implications and the time frame for a lot of this takes care of, but um, looking at the at what's happened out there, that cut is definitely contributing to where this water is going. So I would I would like to see that, um, you know, last April when it was obviously, it says April 22, um, brought to attention, it's a long period of time. And I think, um, you know, how long, how long do we keep letting people get away with something that's going to affect the whole lot of landowners? So that's the first one. Um, also looking at the at the river catchment, um, we, walk, we walk down it. Um, look, what was done on that river years and years ago, and it's happened all over the country, was, was at the time thought to be the right thing to do and planting these rivers with um, willows. Um, the problem with it is that they need maintenance and we've got, the minute they fall over into a river, they start sprouting from the riverbed up and, and um, the potential, to, I call them beaver dams, but potential to create beaver dams down the river um, is then back, back stuff up and, and you've got a blowout somewhere. So look, to me that, that culvert, initially you, you will still get this, it'll go over banks and different places, but I think that's the first thing that needs to be urgently um, mitigated. Um, but but I, I did feel that there's some real issues there as far as Manatipi Township goes, if something happens downstream further um, towards the main bridge um, with a real um, block that we, we saw, different places with the forestry slash getting caught up against it. Um, look, I've read the report and, and I understand um, the perceived ramifications of accepting somebody's offer um, that may pre um, create a precedent, um, but I will, in David Clark's defense, I will um, say that um, this is not actually affecting his land very much. He sold a block of land 
off his original title, which Roma Ficardu owned. And unfortunately, that is the block that ends up getting flooded probably the most, as well as the people on the way down through. Um, so, you know, to say that it's um, he's personally gaining, I, I think we're taking that out of context. Um, I, I just think it's something that really needs to be considered um, um, because it is an offer. It's not going to cost the council, um, you know, um, in the long term, other than I feel it is, is quite important. So, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's a really quite a, obviously a very historic issue, but, you know, it kind of goes back to the times when once upon a time when a tree fell into the uh, river on someone's property or off a river running through someone's property, they'd go and they'd take it out and um, it wouldn't impact anyone down the track or anything like that. We've got compliance, health and safety and all these issues nowadays that are compounding anyone who's too scared to, <laughs> to go in and rectify things. So I can really feel for the landowners out there, um, the consequences of another um, rainfall, which wasn't that heavy at that particular time, causing the same thing is huge. And, uh, you know, I, I've... I would like to think that we are going to make some solution to this or have some um, yeah, solution given to the landowners out there that something is going to happen in the near future rather than um, putting it on the back burner and making it last uh, where no one, what no one wants. Um, the, other, the other thing is Ron Vicata are a big, huge player in this particular area and I'd like to know what their stance is on this because, um, yeah, it is on the, yeah, it is on the report. So that, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Chair. Okay. Uh, sorry, Chair, if I may, just in regards to um, Councillor Telfer's comments there around the funding. So, should Council look to fund the extra, so to accept the proposal with the clerks around the $100,000, it's around how that is then paid back. And so, the way that that would have to be done would be spread across the ratepayers within that TRI area. Part of the proposal is that we continue with the BAU works that we had programmed as well. So that would mean that we would then have to do an additional rate on top of all of those targeted rate owners to pay back the $100,000 as part of that. We're unable to just add a rate in without consulting with them first. So it's the paying back of the $100,000 and where that funding comes from. So Pauline will probably kill me, but we have the facility to take on more debt as an organization. So the ability to fund $100,000 can happen. The issue for us with any debt we take on is how we repay that debt. So to undertake this works, we would have to look at what are the repayment options and how that would then be spread across the ratepayers who are going to be benefiting from that. So that's where staff have a concern with the proposal that we haven't spoken to any of the other ratepayers in that district who contribute towards it, let alone reprioritizing their works or adding an additional rate on at this stage. Uh, Councillor Ria, Councillor Orden. Is there an opportunity to access the better off funding in order to mitigate the drain cut? Because as the drain cut has been identified as causing a lot of, there's no. Uh, through the chair, the drain cut is something that could be easily resolved by the landowner. So the landowners modified their whenua and that is then contributed to the problem. So it's an issue for the community because of the works that have been done, but it's our first stance is the landowner should be rectifying the issue that they have made rather than us using rate power funding to fix something they've modified. Councillor Order. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> I've got quite a lot to cover. Do you want me to try and cover it in one hit? Um, I'll give it a go. Um, I'd just like to make a point that Council's just spent $300,000 or in the process of spending $300,000 protecting three houses of Wainui. Um, we're talking here an extra $15,000 a year over the next three years to agreed. It's a, it's a quick solution, but it could potentially rescue hundreds of acres of crop. If I could just bear with me, that is the river we have at the moment. Over my years of having pumps set down here and watching that river rise at a great rate of knots, and then seeing it change in shape, this might help a little bit. So these, are, these trees catch the silt and change the profile of the river. And we have a volume in here. This volume at the moment equals a one in 10 year flood. Okay, don't quote me totally on the figures, but this is, this is where we're heading for. 
a flood every one in 10 years. The point at which it's breaking at the moment is its lowest point and where it always goes. The drain that is cut there at the moment, it is a minor problem. I think it's a little bit of a red herring, but if anything, it's a little bit of an early warning system because when this river goes in the past, it's a flash flood that hits straight down into houses and roads. With that drain, there is a, an early warning increase in flow that says the TRI is getting right up. Um, <clears throat> there's comments here about the worry of slumping and comments about planting willows. Slumping is the best friend of that river. And when the tr willow trees, as they used to be, are cut and poisoned, you end up with slumping and you end up with a riverbed that looks like that with a volume three times the one we have at the moment. And this is a, a flood every one in a hundred years. The area that has been proposed to be um, uh, problem solved, I don't believe will have any downstream effect. Um, it's been done piecemeal over the years. And in the past, the timber has been left in the river, just chopped and left and it's been washed out to sea. This now is not allowed to be done, which is gonna double the cost of the process, um, which then puts it beyond reach, which then creates the problem. So um, I think we need to tackle this quickly, or we're gonna have egg on our faces with a tropical storm, either this year or the next year. It's a, it's a, a very gracious offer in my opinion. And uh, I was told yesterday that it, will run out of its interest-free status fairly quickly with the way interest rates are going up. Um, so yeah, I'm for the idea. It's a quick fix. And I've also spoken to Ron Carter representative. They are interested in a long-term plan. They need a long-term solution for that river. Thank you. Councillor Branson. Um, I'm very familiar with this area. My wife was born there and lived on the banks of the Tiara River. So I, I know I've had visits there in the past where there has been flooding in that whole area. Essentially, it is a floodplain. That whole area is a floodplain, always has been a floodplain. So it's always going to be problematic. My concern is that I don't see 100K fixing the problem. So that's where the work has to be done because it might fix short strips of the problem, short, short sections of the problem, but for the problem to be solved, the whole, whole catchment has to be looked at, which is well north of 100K. So um, yeah, I just don't, I, I'm concerned that if we did go down that track, we would fix a bit of the problem and created a problem somewhere else. So, and I'm sure that will come out of the work that's being done. Um, I don't know what three houses you're talking about. We're spending 300k on. Oh, Councillor Gregory. Thank you. Um, so a lot of my questions have been answered as this has been going on, but um, I do feel for the landowners out there. I wonder if um, in the financial budget part of this um, agenda on page 16, uh, we say that we if, don't want to accept it because finance and affordability have never come across such an arrangement. And I just think that that should never be a reason for something just because we've never come across it before. And then the next thing is um, don't want to introduce this arrangement due to legal issues, which aren't really identified in this report and maybe someone could enlighten me about that. And then it goes on further that if uh, it would need to be paid back by the landowners. Um, so we'd have to charge the metro, which uh, Mr. Wilson was just speaking about. Are, are, are these landowners presumably the same ones that are affected by the flooding? And Perhaps that is a feasible um, option for these landowners who clearly, especially Mr. Clark, are very frustrated about the situation. Through your chair, I'll get Pauline to answer the rating components of that um, and how who it would affect and how the rating impact that would be. 
and the hesitation around why they'd fund it. Um, for the wider area for the, for what we're actually trying to do here, this would not benefit all of the rate payers within that catchment. It would be a targeted number of those that would benefit from it. All of the but I'll hand to Pauline to discuss the rating components of it. Um, so this area um, is one of the um, highly targeted rates. Um, and basically when you've got a highly targeted rates, it's usually what we collect on those group of people, that's what's charged. And so if there is a significant change um, of that component from what they had been charged before to what they will be charged, it will require consultation with those um, rate payers. You cannot just apply it and say they'll accept it because some of those within that group of the 300 and I haven't got the numbers of 385 um, for 2023 um, may not receive that same benefit as some of the others that are closest to it. So, uh, but you are applying a cost and they have to, they have to know it. We have to consult um, with those um, uh, overall costs. The other parts of it, um, as Dave said, um, the issue is not funding. If you decide that you want to spend something, um, you can do it. We don't go into enter into an arrangement with a private person. We have that ability to draw that, to do that. Where you come for issues is you suddenly start saying that some of your services are going to be contracted to someone else with a different arrangement. Um, you're bypassing our uh, levels of service um, and what we've said with the uh, community for our annual plan in a long-term plan. So you've got to be mindful of those kind of the processes that you're doing. But if you're saying that you need to do something that it's in terms of an emergency and you believe that you're going to do it, you do have an issue of who should pay for it. And if it is under the same group of targeted people that it was before, then you do need to consult um, with them with regards to it. Um, uh, and that's the issue that you actually have um, with this overall um, consideration of this paper. Yes. Just supplementary to that, in the recommendations um, that we decline the proposal, the second one is prioritise the work as needed. Who's deciding as needed? So three year chair. That's around option two, where we would do the extra $125,000 work over three years. We'd reprioritize the take from the Manatuki Drainage District, and then we'd then prioritize that work, and then step back on the other work that we were looking to do as part of that. Again, when you do that, it's reprioritizing a whole catchment across there. So the, of that group, there is 600 and... Uh, 50 odd thousand that you collect in rates and then you share it across all those drainage districts and when you change that level of service from what you were had planned to what you may do that is a change for what you consulted and you changed within your annual plan now because it's so more and normally we wouldn't say it's an issue but it's a change of level of service for those people and you need to be able to um uh, work with them, talk to them to say, are you comfortable with that when it benefits over some or the other? Otherwise, you have to decide that you are going to approve unbudgeted expenditure um, to do the work um, and knowing that it probably won't come in at the end of the year uh, with the overall costs. So that's the council's decision process that you do. Um, but in terms of this very targeted rate, you have to be mindful of how that works, how you collect that rate. And if you're changing one service to the benefit of others, um, then the, that needs to have a consultation process as well. You will. So when I read the paper yesterday, I thought there we would acknowledge Mr. Clark's very generous offer, but because of legal and financial complications, we might not consider it at this stage. But then when I moved to option two, I thought there was a good compromise happening there that it might not be happening, the work isn't happening immediately, um, which it would in any way, because there are so many flood damage work happening up the coast at this stage that I can imagine it will take a little time 
anyway. But then when I read number two, I thought there was some compromise there and that there are some budget in there that stuff will be done. So I was relatively uh, calm around this paper. Am I correct? So through you, Chair, just to clarify the, for the committee, it is as your worship has just suggested. Mm -hmm. So there are some smaller budgets that we will look mm -hmm. to try and find some extra funding yes. for where we can that falls in line with our annual plan and our 10 year plan going forward. That is what we are committing to say we will do. We will prioritise as we do with all of our budgets where the need is most needed, and we will do that as part of the funding buckets. Um, Probably the best way to explain it, we've got buckets that we're able to take funds out for particular parts yeah, of the catchments. Right. We're saying where we can, we'll prioritise those around getting the TRI back where we need to. However, as we're trying to explain in the paper, we need a longer term catchment approach for the TRI, which as um, Councillor Alder has said, is Wonga Whakata's preference. So it's working with them around what does that TRI catchment plan look like? As part of that, we can then build in the catchment plan budgets and then the maintenance budgets as part of your long-term plan going forward. As part of a much bigger picture that we don't want to scare you with yet, but we want to talk to you about, we need to talk about Anoda, Nuhiri, Tokumaru, Uawa, I can go on and on and on. Farikaika, um, see Councillor Honomaya. So it's around how do we actually make sure that we've got all of those as part of how we resource up, and we're going to need to resource up this area. We absolutely admit mm. that as an organisation, but it's how we do that going forward, and then how do you want us to prioritise that across the community as well? So the proposal for us is around we have suggested to decline the, and it is a very generous offer from the Clark family and we thank them for the offer, but it's around, we need to prioritize things, work with the effective rate payers to come up with a longer term solution while we make sure we're getting the best return on prioritizing the funding we have available at the moment. That's what we're suggesting, but we're in your hands. You can tell but us then just good. supplementary to that, just to clarify it for myself that I'm not missing it. We are saying thank you very much, but we are going to do work Option two is work on the ground happening in the TRI, not in the next, which was proposed um, in Mr. Clark's proposal, but work will happen in the next three years while we then set up our long-term catchment plan. Correct? Correct. Thank you. So is there any way that we can make a commitment um, inside three years i mean you know three years is a long time um yeah. so um and I, I think mr clark would be very not happy at all and um a lot of the people out there would be un very unhappy if um we said oh well in the next three years we're going to look at it um can we get a commitment that um this will be done in the next six months or or a year even um to, to address the main concerns of this, this issue to start with with a with a with a mind a catchment plan um to be formulated so through you, Chair, the only way for us to do it is through the annual plan process where you're able to do redo our plans, where you decide as part of that how you're prioritising our spends. That's done in your annual plan process, which is coming up. So that is for the 23-24 financial year. That's your avenue for changing those things because it is, as, as Pauline has explained, this is not an insignificant thing to move large pockets of money around when we've rated for it and taken it for a specific purpose for our community. But it still doesn't really. So option two is still a little bit loose. <laughs> I would rather it be um, um, a little bit more of a commitment rather than um, this. You know, it could be in the next three years. I, I'm just I'm not quite comfortable with that um, as a recommendation at this stage. Um, Councillor Hurudi Hurawai. Thank you. Um, I appreciate Mr. Clark's offer, and you know the frustration that he must feel watching, because we have that all across all of our communities, watching things we can see about to happen and we have no, no resource or means to be able to fix it. And he's offering a solution for the problem that he can see in front of him, which I absolutely appreciate. But I also appreciate the amount of work that's going on in the region, across the region, and trying to get the mahi done. It's already been unaccounted for and is being done under emergency situations. And my concern is that if um, we support this, then as um, Mr. Wilson has said, we're gonna, and Paulina said, we will take money from over there to pay for that over there. Take money from communities who, you know, who desperation of roading 
uh, really, and other in fixing the problems that are already started work on to fix the problem over here. I wonder if we can find a, um, a win-win situation for everybody, uh, for Mr. Clark. Um, because the, yeah, I, I just, it's, I feel for him and the communities around the in terms of watching something about to happen and wanting to be able to fix it and, um, and needing the support of the council to do that. Setting precedents is, I really, really um, uh, worried about setting precedents as well. Um, and also, you know, I also consider those that you, communities who don't have a Mr. Clark in them, who has the money to be able to put up and say, well, I can do this if you'll come and do that. Um, so that's a concern for me also in, in the sense of it. It's not an easy decision, but I appreciate all the background information you've been provided to help us to make the decision. We're not here to not make difficult decisions, so thank you. Councillor Robinson. Councillor Pahuru Huriwai has just um, eloquently said exactly what I was going to say. The precedent setting aspect of this for communities that don't have the putia or someone like Mr. Clark is a generous offer, but the precedent setting is, is alarming for me. Um, the, lawyer, the lawyer brain of me says the precedent this would set um, will end in tears one day. The other thing is, if Mr. Clark was to fund the mahi that's to be done on that land, where does the legal liability lie when at the end of the day, he's doing it on borrowed money from us. We are literally going to have no control but all responsibility if there's a disaster on that land, if there's a trees aren't clear and there's a flash flood and it, it turns out that it was mismanaged at the end of the day, we're paying him to do that work. Are we liable? Would it come back to us? Would our insurance cover it? Would his insurance cover it? Like it's just so many legal nightmares, scenarios that arise out of this. Um, I really appreciate this, the Mahi, uh, Mr. Wilson and his team are gonna be doing under option two. I'm sure he understands the uh, urgency um, that has been expressed at this table, um, but I, I would certainly support the, uh, the, the notion as it stands, the motion as it stands at the moment, that we decline with, with uh, gratitude to Mr. Clark and that we um, action option two with um, expediency. Three, three, Chair, if I may quickly. There's a simple amendment to the recommendations if it pleases the committee. So for option two, prioritizes the works as needed across the TRI catchment and implement the changes through the annual plan, full stop. Then you know that we're going to have it through your next annual plan, which is 2023. And that's about as quick as we're going to be able to do it, given where we're sitting in construction season, all the competing priorities and staff, that would be as quick as we'd be able to move for it. Okay, I mean, you know, this, this just raises a lot of... Um, concern that we're going to be facing for the near future and for our next long-term plan when it comes to climate change you know we're going to have to start budgeting quite heavily for all the um, outcomes of climate change that we're facing in our region it's um and, and across the country everyone's going to have to be faced with the whole thing so it's almost like um you know a government <laughs> another government um grant of some sort to, to cover all these huge initiatives that we're having to fund with from from the impacts of um the huge weather events Councillor Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm most grateful for the amendments to option two. I think that's coming a long way to um, address much of the feeling around the table. And it would be nice to um, hope that um, Mr. Clark might be involved in some of that um, planning as well as um, with the Carter. Um, I certainly um, in my little concern that the wrong for Carter input is relatively light mm. into this. And that's because they're they're new to this kind of game as well. And um, I think that in terms of um, the changes to option two, that they be also assuring that they have support coming into that process as well. Yeah. And so that their involvement is, is full and, and fair um, to them. Um, I certainly understand Mr. Clark's anxiety around, um, it doesn't appear to be enough getting done over a very long time. And during the visit we had, um, trees don't grow overnight. These, the, the issue has been there and trees are 20 foot tall. So um, it has been a very, very long time for somebody to sit back and just observe and wait. And so I understand um, his passion to want to come forward. I don't see in this port, um, which is where I'm heading, it's about infrastructure and um, 
I think it has to be more than that. It's, there's not enough for me about community, about the well-beings of those communities and their anxiety and, and the pressure that they are under. We, we're not reading about that in this report, and so we can't calculate that in our deliberations. Um, but I fully understand the folk at um, Ohako Marae who had to physically move their dining room, what they felt as, as family and hapu and as iwi, um, isn't discussed in these reports. The mental well-being of our communities is vital to where we need to be prioritising um, where we set our resources. And um, absolutely, we must calculate that on the engineering and the, the infrastructure that's before us. But there is a, a component for me that's missing. Mm. And um, operations should be better than that. Um, and I think what um, Councillor Pahuruhuriwai is talking about um, as we move forward into um, facing climate change, if we hope to do that together, then we need to understand the mental well-being of our community as we go forward into making some extremely difficult decisions in the future. Um, I don't know if um, folk from operations are prepared for that sort of thing, but I'd like operations and, and our other departments of council to consider the mental well-being that really prompted this whole report. Mm. And that's a, a farmer who's waited a long time and seen nothing. And um, the stress of then somebody on a property cutting a drain and take, thinking they're taking an initiative, probably doing much worse, but we're not addressing the mental capacity that because of the long-term um, lack of response or apparent response from council that we have formed in our community. And, and, and we, this is a, a symptom of the backlash that will come. If you're not going to do it, I'm going to bloody get on my track and do it myself. If you haven't got funding, I'm going to put funding. And we're not addressing that mentality that's growing in our community. And it, it'll be worse. It'll be at Whanikaika. It'll be at Nuiti at, at Anoda. Mm -hmm. And um, these, that aspect of the human nature of the tairawhiti is missing in these types of reports. Yeah. yeah that, that's what I meant earlier about um, what, um, hearing what from Ramavakata said, because I know I, I hear what they saw, saw in the report that, that they want um, a long term uh, plan for it, but it would have been nice to have some representative here representing them to just to have a view of um, the, the, um, where they come from as well, you know, what, they're, what they're thinking, um, because everyone, everyone is involved in this area and they're a major player as well. So, yeah, uh, anyway. Uh, one, I'll, I'll, I think we'll thrash this a bit, but I'll one, one more, Councillor Telfer. Yes, I've already spoken, so sorry about that. Um, look, I, I just I just want to leave, us all to leave here um, knowing that, that a lot of the stuff we're doing in this district is reactionary. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and that's no one's fault. It's, this has been an fun, ongoing funding thing for a long time, and we we tend to be waiting for these events, and then we're, we're rushing around like um, blue ass flies trying to fix a problem, um, I see this as an, an opportunity to front foot something. And, and we've got a generous um, person that's willing to put the money up front. And, and you know we're saying now that, look, we're going to look at it, we're going to do it, and whether it's next year, the year after, or three years' time. But in the meantime, we can have another disaster that's going to cost us this, this district way more than what we're talking about here. Um, I understand um, Tony's um, from a lawyer's perspective and the legal team's perspective. Um, but David's offer was that he look he he will supervise it or whatever. It was the it was the Fulton Hogan um, contractor, which was our contractor. Um, I, I don't see that as um, I think you can totally eliminate David from the thing. That was just an offer. Um, I'm sure that we can it can be done right through through the council, so all our insurances and everything are covered. It, this is just an opportunity to front foot something, and I, and I see that as proactive rather than reactive. So. All right, thank you. Okay, well, um, I'm going to put it to the, to the table, um, the recommendations, and um, thank Mr. Clark, David Clark, really sincerely for his offer, but um, the Operations Committee declines the Clark farming proposal. And two, prioritises the works as needed across the TRI catchment and implement through the annual plan, full stop.
and three, implements a council review of the level of service across the district for drainage district maintenance as part of the long-term plan. All those in favour? All those opposed? Okay, it's carried. Okay, well, we'll get on to the next report. And that is on page 23, the Gisborne Water Supply, meeting the new water quality assurance rules. I have my objection recorded. Sure. Yeah. We... So through the chair, just as Judith's coming up here, um, I'm not let you hide, Judith. <laughs> So just to introduce Judith, who I think most of you will have met at the cafe, the World Cafe. Oh, I thought you'd done that one. Sorry, Judith, my bad, stay there. I'll come and sit with oh, me sorry, anyway. No, we're gonna appoint a deputy. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, mate. My apologies. I thought you'd done it. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, that's on page 20. Uh, appoint a deputy chairperson of the operations committee. I'm not going to uh, nominate a, um, a potential Chairperson, I'd like someone to nominate or put their names forward as a uh, deputy to the Operations Infrastructure Committee. <laughs> All right, okay, we've got a nomination. Is there any other nominations? Okay, all those in favor, hands up for Teddy Thompson. <laughs> We didn't, we didn't ask you if you wanted or not. I'm sorry, you're it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, page 23, Gisborne Water Supply meeting the new water quality assurance rules. So, kia ora tato. Um, Really pleased to bring this before you. It, um, this report really is just to give you an update on how we're getting on in terms of meeting the new water compliance regime. And, and particularly to bring to you um, an understanding that um, even through change, uh, you know, our water supply is a safe supply. A lot of change that happens are threshold changes. It doesn't mean to say that what we've done for the last 20 years hasn't been sufficient. Um, but, you know, um, making sure that water supply are, is safe in New Zealand, you know, things have really moved and we're moving with the times as well. But throughout um, delivery of water services, there's always risk. And what I want to bring to you today is the fact that there is always risk, even though we do everything possible to stay in control and to assure the water we supply is safe. Things happen around us. And you've been talking a lot about climate related matters and similar. Um, this is a mechanical operational type um, process to treat water. So this report in front of you is just highlighting that until we have our new UV treatment facility built at the Wanaki plant, our main water treatment plant, throughout the summer, we have an inability to meet all the new compliance um, thresholds for disinfection when we run the, um, if we run the Wainaki plant at its full summer flows. So you have to remember the bulk of our water supply, like around 98% of our water supply comes from the Wainaki water treatment plant. So normally over summer from here on, we're, we're pushing a lot of water into Gisborne. So what we're doing this year is we're running both of our water treatment plants. The Waipawa plant is a fully fledged, very well appointed water treatment plant as well. Normally we use it as a backup or an augmentation plant to offset demand and to save the water up at Wainiki for the long hot reach of summer. This year we're running it in parallel for a much longer period so that we can keep our Wainiki plant within the flows we know that we can meet compliance. Now meeting compliance is a little of an abstract thing. It doesn't mean to say the water supply is unsafe, but meeting compliance is a really important function for, um, for, for public and for industry. You know, like having, um, e even though we would know there's no bacteria in the water and that we have confidence the water's really safe, if we had reporting coming through saying we're non-compliance because we didn't meet a threshold, um, the you know different industry and water users don't not, don't understand that the, it doesn't mean the water's unsafe. It means that part of an operational process wasn't met. So we're doing our utmost to make sure we do meet full compliance. 
but I can't, re I just want to um, underpin today that there's always risk in delivery. And particularly when we're very relying this year then on the Waipawa plant, when we have a large rainfall and big fresh and the water's absolutely filthy, the volume we can treat that water at is limited because of the amount of silt in the water. So we have to slow the whole treatment process down. So there's this real balancing act going on around treatment volume, treatment quality, treatment speed. So that in a nutshell is where we're at. We are in a really good position about meeting the new compliance regime. You know, we've, um, we do have quality water systems and we have good quality people treating our water. Our water treatment operators are first class. And we have a very good monitoring team here in-house at Council that do a lot of the monitoring work for us as well. So we've already put investment through existing capital into new monitoring equipment to meet compliance. And the one thing outstanding for us is our UV plant, which is coming and it'll be June um, next year for commissioning. So we're getting through the summer in good condition, not taking risks, but just to be aware things happen. And some of those things are very much outside of our control. The, the, the thing we won't be doing is we won't be running Gisborne out of water, all right? So we have restrictions available as well, obviously, but, you know, they are, um, if we really, really are in challenge space and we need to ask, you know, can, uh, users to pull back on water use, so um, that is a tool available to us as well. Councillor Orla. Thank you, Chair. It sounds like a free water scare tactic to me, the whole changing the um, um, chlorine levels. But now, can you explain to me that we used to have a six, so concentration over time used to be a figure of six, it's now 15. This time period is measured presumably in the treatment station only uh, to give you the um, FAC of 0.2. Is there no account taken for the contact time in the pipe by the time it gets to Gisborne? So am I right in thinking that in a scenario in Hawke's Bay, we come straight out of the ground, gets treated two seconds, two minutes later, it's coming out of a tap. These conditions would be understandable, but in our situation, it's BS, excuse my scenario. Thank you. So, so one of the things the new assurance rules has done is made it very clear that it's um, the um, this measure is on water leaving your clear water treatment facility. It used to be a little bit fudged, a little bit fuzzy, and you could use part of your pipeline. But equally, we have our first customers really close on our pipeline. So, you know, even the rural customers and some of them are top up to rainwater tanks and similar, but they're still our customers. So we have an obligation and responsibility to serve them safe water just as we do for all the customers in Gisborne City itself. So, um, so the answer to your question is yes, the threshold changes, the rule changes have made it very clear it's about treating water in the tank before it leaves. You can't use your kilometres of pipeline as part of the treatment process. We used to, we used to be able to model it for that purpose, yeah. Councillor Robinson. I may have missed this, but when did you say that the um, UV treatment will come online um, and will we be running the white power uh, to supplement for that entire period until it comes online? And if so, because the white power is, is very expensive to run, what is the anticipated additional OPEX with that? So no, we won't be running right through. We will run until demand falls back to what we can comfortably meet from the Wainiki plant alone under gravity flow, the, the flow that we know we can meet compliance at. So um, at the moment, we are well above that already, which is normal for this time of year. And we expect that, depending on the weather, um, it's normally around early April, mid-April, when demand drops back down again to where we know we can meet compliance from Wainiki alone. Um, operating costs, what I do know is that the cost of treating water just based on chemicals and power, it's around about 15 cents a cubic metre from Waipawa and around about three cents from Wainiki. And that's because Wainiki works under gravity. We don't use pumping power, you know. So um, it is a lot more expensive because we have to pump out of the river at Waipawa and we have to pump into Gisborne at Waipawa. And it's a different treatment process as well. There's a lot more powered components to treat the water at Waipawa. So yeah, so there's a, there's a balance. We do have operating budget for both plants and I do anticipate being able to meet budget by this regime. We'll just be really careful about 
um, what else we do during these during this operating period. Normally there'd be um, say water blasting or other maintenance gets done at plant, maybe that we defer some of those things to next budget. So we'll balance as best we can within the within the budgets we have. Just a question I have. Um, I know the industrial water is consented, but is there a demand for more um, you know, industrial water um, from previous years, this year, an increase in industry or? Um, not so far. This, this year, some of the large players that would normally um, use a lot of water in a pre-season early run aren't doing those crops, so they, they're not operating so much right now. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's quite a traditional trend. We do expect it all to come on as per normal about mid-January. A, a lot for, for the industry depends on weather as well, exactly yeah. when they fit. Yeah. So it's relatively consistent. Weather for us is very strongly linked to demand, particularly this time of year in spring. So sunny days means lots and lots of water is used. It's just a nature of people keeping gardens looking good, grass green, you know, keeping fresh. And industry, you know, seasonal industry coming on as well. Okay. Yeah, um, you mentioned running in parallel, and I don't know if I've got it wrong, but in the past we've run one and the other. In parallel, does that mean you can run both at the same time? Right. Yeah, so where's the mixing point? Uh, uh, so, so historically we've always used, we've run in parallel. It's very rare for us to run Wai Power Plant and by itself. Yeah. Um, so in the mixing points, just the side of Makaraka pump station, do you know where that is? Where the beautiful garden is now, you can drive past. <laughs> <laughs> Infrastructure yeah. doesn't have to be ugly. Um, so is the testing point this side of the mixing point or the other side of the mixing point? Uh, well, we test on this side of the mixing point. We test all over the show, oh. actually. There's lots of testing regime, leaving plant at city boundary. Mm -hmm. All right, is there any more questions? Yep, it's a noting report, moved by Your Worship, seconded by Councillor Tolfer. And all those in favour? Aye. Aye. Carried. Thank you so much, Judith. Yeah, thank you. And, uh, yeah. okay, um, close the meeting. Close the meeting and um, officially close the meeting now. And uh, David just wants to have a word to us afterwards, if that's okay. We've got a few minutes. Okay, so.